Magic and Holy Writ The scriptures speak of magic as something whose existence no one doubts. Here, magic is a reality. The widespread condemnation of the occult does not arise from the suspicion that its magical operations are exploited for deception, but because magic is morally and socially harmful, indulging in what is forbidden and doing violence to divine teaching. Holy Writ recognizes God as a governor having jurisdiction over mankind. Piety and good deeds, it is true, influence him favorably, but men's destinies are ultimately in his hands, and when he strikes the good man, it is not from injustice, for his ways are inscrutable, beyond moral comprehension. The Mosaic religion, like the Christian, opposed magic as an illicit tampering with God's power. But being itself an outgrowth of magic, its ritual contains many elements whose magical origin can hardly be denied. The biblical miracle is not entirely unlike the magical prodigies recorded in Holy Writ, the distinction being that the one is performed by the will with the help of Jehovah, whereas the other is brought forth with the assistance of the evil one. Janus and Jombers, conjurers of the Pharaonic court, are wizards capable of imitating many of Moses' miracles, changing staffs into serpents and conjuring up swarms of frogs. The devil, who is the ape of God, taught them to counterfeit the divine miracles of the prophet. The devil's power, however, is limited. The conjurers were able to bring forth frogs, but it lay beyond their wisdom to make them disappear again. In this way, the Bible distinguishes between the miracle and the prodigy of black magic. The onlooker in Pharaoh's court must have regarded Moses simply as the more able magician. An unmistakably magical operation is performed by the patriarch Jacob. When they divided the herds, Jacob and his father-in-law Laban agreed that Laban was to have the unspotted animals, while all spotted goats should be Jacob's. Then Jacob procured some fresh boughs of poplar, almond, and plain, and peeled these rods in alternate stripes of white and dark, and he put them in the gutters in the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink. The animals copulated duly, and the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle ring-streaked, speckled, and spotted. Jacob was using his striped sticks according to the magical principle that like produces like. Striped boughs produce stripes upon the animals' hides. He did not gain his wealth through divine intervention. It was not a miracle which produced the spots upon the patriarch's cattle, but rather Jacob's knowledge of magic. We learn from the biblical narrative that Joseph practiced divination by hydromancy. That is, he wanted to discover hidden things by gazing into water. When his brothers were leaving the land of Egypt with their sacks of grain, Joseph caused a silver goblet to be hidden in Benjamin's sack. This vessel was not for drinking purposes only. In fact, the Bible says, he used it for divination. The practice of hydromancy must have been general in Joseph's time. He speaks about it as of something well known, not only to the Egyptians, but also to the Hebrews. Did you not know that a man like me would be sure to use divination? Moses, seeking to free his people from the plague of serpents, set up the bronze image of a snake in the wilderness. This statue had the character of a talisman, such images were used at all times as a protection against various evils. According to conceptions of magic, like not only produces like, but also propitiates it. Gregory of Tours tells how the Parisians, excavating for a bridge, found strange metals whose significance was unknown to them. One of these magical coins depicted a rat, another a snake, and a third a flame. These talismans, Gregory says, were lost or destroyed, and since that time Paris has known rats, snakes, and conflagrations, three plagues which formerly had spared the city. The Magus Jacques Gafferel, the learned librarian of Richelieu, reports that during the capture of Constantinople by Mohammed II, the jaw of a bronze snake chanced to be broken. This image had a talismanic virtue, and from that time on the city's snakes began to multiply in an uncanny way. Gafferel also mentions the snake of Moses, but pronounces it not to have been a magical image since it was made of copper, the sight of which, according to him, aggravates snake bites. 
He argues that Moses must have fashioned the statue in this metal to convince his people that it was no talisman, but that its effects were divinely rather than magically wrought. This argument seems some. In the book of Numbers, we find a custom which must be classified as magical, since it does not merely pray for a divine verdict, but insists on obtaining one. The jealous husband, suspecting his wife of unfaithfulness, brings her before the priest. After performing some ceremonies, the priest, summoning the woman, bids her to take her stand before the Lord, loosening the hair of her head. Then the priest pours the consecrated water into an earthenware jug, and after further ceremonies orders her to drink thereof. When he has made her drink the water, if she has defiled herself and has been unfaithful to her husband, then the water that brings the curse upon entering her shall cause her pain. Her womb shall become easily fertile, but she shall have miscarriages, so that the woman shall become an execration among her people. But if the woman is not defiled, she shall be immune and shall bear children. Another custom of the Jews, one prescribed by their cult, arose from the belief that evil could be discharged into an animal. In the New Testament, Jesus cures a demoniac night and day shrieking among the tombs and cutting himself with stones. The Messiah casts out these sons of darkness, who thereupon rush into a herd of swine. A very old ceremony was connected with this belief. Before the Hebrews could give themselves over to the Feast of the Tabernacles and its joys, a purification rite had to be performed on the preceding Day of Atonement. The high priest cast lots over two he-goats, one falling to Yahweh, the other to Azazel. They offered up the Lord's goat in the usual manner, but the scapegoat, that was Azazel's, they sent into the wilderness with the sins of Israel. The suffix El, Lord, suggests that in an earlier age Azazel had been a deity, perhaps a local god of primitive Semitic tribes. On being discarded as a god, Azazel was banished to the wilderness as an unclean being, an object of scorn, upon which the people might purge their misdeeds. Of all magic usages, divination of future and hidden things gained the strongest foothold in Israel. We learn from the scriptures that the Syrian Laban, Rachel's father, possessed the teraphim, the household gods. He thought their oracle to be of unfailing truth. When Rachel eloped from her father's house with Jacob, she took with her the idols whose reliability she had learned to trust when still a child. In her simple belief, she feared the teraphim would tell Laban the direction of their flight. And when Laban, unaided by the oracles, overtook the pair, Rachel resolved to keep the teraphim, concealing them beneath her skirts. The idols were the only things of her home that Rachel would not forego in the outside world. This survival of the pastoral faith passed into the popular magic of Israel. We do not know how one questioned the teraphim, nor how they answered, but like the lares in Rome, the teraphim were to be found in many houses of Israel. In vain, the prophet Zechariah argued that the teraphim have given vain answers. The interrogation of God was a good and legal thing when it took place in the temple. Prior to a weighty transaction of state, his will had to be discovered through the ephod oracle. The high priest wore shoulder pieces set with onyx stones and a woven sash embroidered with gold. Over this outer garment called the ephod, he donned the square breastplate with the urim and the thummim, twelve jewels through which Jehovah spoke, giving strategic counsel in times of war, pointing out transgressors and predicting things to come. But often God would withhold his advice. When angered, he not infrequently denied help to his blaspheming people. Then the kings in despair might turn to soothsayers, who deserved the death penalty, according to the law. A man or woman in whom there is a pythonic or divining spirit, dying, let them die. King Saul turned to necromancy when the ephod remained mute. He was seeking foreknowledge of the battle in which he was to be fatally wounded. With a few trusted men, he stole out by night to visit the witch of Endor. Divine now for me by the familiar spirit, he says, and bring up for me whom I shall indicate to you. Whom shall I bring up for you, said the woman. Bring Samuel up for me, said he. Then the spirit of Samuel rose from the ground, an old man wrapped in a mantle. 
he confronted the terrified king with his approaching death. Was this the real Samuel, sent by God to frighten the anxious king, or was it a phantom from hell? This much-debated question is left unanswered in the scriptures. Saul had always fought sorcery and witchcraft in his kingdom. Yet he was more superstitious than other Hebrew rulers. Too often he had consulted the Ephod oracle, and the Lord grew weary of his questioning. Neither could his virtuous successor David rid himself of these magical beliefs. Once, when there was a blight in the kingdom, David interrogated the ephod, which placed the blame on Saul. Saul, having been gathered to his fathers, lay beyond the reach of the hungry and irate people, but many of his sons were still alive. David ordered seven of them to be sought out, and they were hanged before the Lord at the beginning of the barley harvest in the spring. When the autumn rains came at last, Falling upon their dead bodies and upon the scorched earth, their bones were gathered and buried with honor in their ancestors' sepulchre. King Saul's descendants had been used as a rain charm. The magic power that dwelt in their princely bodies, in their bones, had proved efficacious, as David had anticipated. In the Middle Ages, witches used bones to the same end, conjuring up rain and storms. They perpetuated the old belief that bones of the dead, when handled properly, induce rain. We are told that Manasse, thirteenth king of Judah, encouraged the most sacrilegious kind of divination. Manasse shed much innocent blood till he filled Jerusalem up to the mouth. This king of the chosen people saw prophecies of good or evil in the quivering entrails of the slaughtered. Even the great and legendary Solomon did not always behave according to the Lord's behest. In his old age he turned away from the God of his fathers and worshipped the wanton Elohim. He had peopled his harem with foreign women who worshipped their native gods, and in the holy city he had built temples for every creed. His theological and demonological wisdom has become legendary. His magic lamp has and celebrated seal enabled him to command the spirits of hell. A thousand legends concerning Solomon, Suleiman, are scattered through the east. His throne was of ivory, flanked by two sculptured lions overtopped by eagles. When he approached, the lions would roar and the eagles would spread their wings above his venerable head. However, this and other marvelous accounts cannot conceal the fact that after Solomon's reign, Jerusalem fell into a magico-religious chaos. The scriptures, so eloquent concerning Solomon's wealth and magnificence, his wisdom, his horses and chariots, leave unanswered the question as to whether Solomon ever returned to the faith of the one Jehovah.